Today, we're going to look at how Jesus fed a crowd of 5,000 people with just a few loaves and fish. The story begins in Matthew 14, verse 13. As soon as Jesus heard the news. Now, the news was the death of his cousin, John the Baptist. He left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. But the crowds heard where he was headed and followed on foot from many towns. Now, we need to understand the geography here. Jesus was in Galilee. And Galilee was in the northern part of Israel, and it's a very small region, about 50 miles from north to south and 25 miles from east to west. But within that small area, in the time of Jesus, there were over 200 towns and villages with a total population of some 300,000 people. Jesus had left on a boat for a remote area to be alone, to spend some me time, to grieve. But it was difficult to be alone in Galilee. The Sea of Galilee was only eight miles across. And when Jesus left on the boat, people could see where he was going. So they hurried around the top part of the lake, and they were waiting for him on the other side when he arrived. Jesus' desire for some private time was disappointed. He wasn't going to get it. Jesus saw the huge crowds as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. He had compassion on them. A, a literal translation of that phrase is to have one's inner being stirred. To have one's inner being stirred. Eight times in the New Testament, the word compassion is used to describe or to refer to Jesus. For example, do you remember the parable of the prodigal son that's talking ultimately about God's compassion for us? In Mark 15, verse 20, the father, when the prodigal son was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. An Indian Christian named Premanand wrote in his autobiography, As in the days of old, so now our message to the non-Christian world has to be the same, that God cares, that God cares. And this miracle actually illustrates that principle. That evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, that isn't necessary. You feed them. It's interesting, isn't it, that despite all the miracles that the disciples had witnessed, they don't say to Jesus, Jesus, just tell us what to do, and we'll do it. No, their solution is to send the crowd away, to fend for their own needs. 
You know, I'm always amazed at the disciples' lack of faith. And that is until I remember my own. How easily we forget the power of God. And when we do that, we always try to fix our problems on our own with sheer logic rather than by having faith in God. But here's the thing. In every miracle Jesus performed, there came a point where he expected people to have faith. Faith creates the atmosphere in which miracles happen. The disciples, of course, thought they had every angle covered. They knew how Jesus was going to respond. So when he said, that isn't necessary, you feed them, they were ready. But we've only got five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Now, John's gospel fills in some of the other details. Jesus asked this only to test them, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Sometimes, you know, God just tests us to see if we're going to have faith in a certain situation. And again, all Jesus was waiting for them to say was, Jesus, tell us what to do, and we'll do it. But the disciples' reaction? Well, I think it's much like the way I react when I see pictures of thousands of hungry people in television or scenes of tens of thousands of people in refugee camps. Oh, Lord, there are so many of them. What can I possibly do to help? I'm just one person. That's actually why I'm glad I'm a Presbyterian, because we really are a connected church, and we partner with other Presbyterian churches throughout our nation through Presbyterian sharing and Presbyterian world service and development, or locally with other congregations, so that we can do more together than we can do on our own. Listen again to what Jesus said. That isn't necessary to send the crowd away. You feed them. Now again, the disciples clearly knew that Jesus was going to ask them that question. Because John's gospel tells us that Philip had already worked out that to feed the crowd, it would take more than eight months' wages just for every person to have a bite or two. And he knew they didn't have those kinds of resources. Andrew, on the other hand, waded into the crowd and he found a young boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But, as Andrew commented, how far will they go amongst so many? Now pay attention because this is Jesus right here. This is God's power at work. This is the miracle. Bring them here, he said. Then he told the people to sit down on the grass. And Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up to heaven and he blessed them. And then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. 
and they all ate as much as they wanted. That's the miracle. But Jesus isn't finished yet. And afterwards, the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of leftovers. About 5,000 men were fed that day, in addition to all of the women and children. Now, get that last part. There are 5,000 men plus women and children. So Jesus could very well have fed over 30 or 40,000 people with those loaves and fishes. What an amazing miracle this actually is. So here are some important spiritual truths that that miracle can teach us that we can use in our daily lives. First, always start with what you have. Not with what you hope to have someday. Don't wait until you have a big bank account or you've paid off all your debts or you've raised your family uh, before you start to think about what you can give back to God. Do it now. You know, this miracle would not have been possible if a young boy hadn't been willing to share his small lunch. Now, I bet there were other people in the crowd who had had the foresight to bring some food as well, but when Philip went through the crowd, they seemed to have simply hoarded what they had brought with them. They weren't going to share it. And sadly, there are Christians like that as well. But this little boy was willing to share with Jesus the very little he had. He made it available to God, and because he did, the crowd was fed. So let me ask you quite honestly, are you holding back your time, your talents, your treasures? Or are you making them available to God so that He can use them for His work in the world to touch the lives of other people? Second, remember that the miracle of multiplication isn't in your hands. It's in Jesus' hands. It was Jesus' work that resulted in everyone being fed and satisfied. All we can do is, our part, all that's required of us is to make ourselves and our resources available to Jesus as that young boy did. I've said this before, and I'm going to say it to my dying day. I don't believe that congregations have financial problems or volunteer recruitment problems or evangelism problems. I believe we only have faith problems. How much are we as a congregation willing to trust God? How willing are we to trust God as individuals? How much faith are we willing to have? And the third thing we learn from this story is that we need to have a real and a living faith. This is the pivotal point of the miracle. Five small loaves, two small fish, a crowd of at least 30 or 40,000 people. 
The disciples could do the math. The food would run out as it passed along the first row. There would be no food for everyone else. So here was the real test of their faith. Would they say, Jesus, before you go any further, this is just impossible? Or would they remember what Jesus had taught them? That everything is possible for him who believes. We face that same decision every day of our lives. Will we trust God to do the seemingly impossible in our lives, in our church, in our community, in our nation, in our world? And fourth, and please get this one, Jesus blesses us always in abundance. That's why there were 12 baskets of leftovers. Jesus always gives us more than we need so that our blessings can spill over into other people's lives. And if our blessings are not spilling over into other people's lives, let's just name it for what it is, selfishness. So I want to ask you, who are you going to bless this week out of the abundant blessings that God has given you? The day after performing this miracle, John's gospel records these words of Jesus. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never be hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. See, Jesus never performed a miracle just for the fun of it, just because he could. The miracles were always intended to help us to believe in him, to help us to understand that he was the Son of God who has come into the world to save us from our sin and to bring us back into a right relationship with God. And if you get that part of the miracles, then you've got them all. And so we come to the Lord's table. Along with Christians this Sunday in every country in the world. And here, Jesus, in bread and wine, comes to us. And he feeds us. And he comes to be for us God's living bread that always satisfies us. Please stand as we sing the words of the Apostles' Creed in the hymn, I Believe.